and so I spent, you know, a couple of years trying to encourage high schoolers to become preachers. And then I became one. And then I started thinking like, do I really want to encourage teenage boys to become preachers after <laughs> the horrors that I've gone through? This is so much harder than I ever realized. Uh-huh. And the answer is yes. Yes, I still do this. I still believe in it. Um, I'm still passionate about it, though my perception of preaching is different than it once was. I'll, I'll say okay. that uh, initially I was in love with the art of crafting a sermon, studying right. the Bible, delivering yeah. a fiery message with good delivery skills, and, yeah. um, the art of having the exact right story or joke at the exact right time, and then the big twist ending, and yeah, inductive and deductive preaching, and helping people discover a book of the Bible they've never read before through good preaching. I still believe in all of that, but it was very, very quickly into full-time ministry that I came to realize that's only a small piece of what is involved in being a preacher. Right. Specifically, it's about investing in people's lives, walking walking with them through the joys in life, having a baby, getting married, graduating high school, but as well as walking through the horrors of of losing a loved one, um, did a funeral for a a one week old baby a couple of years ago, um, and that was one of the most cherished moments in all of my ministry. It was mm-hmm. excruciatingly difficult, but so rewarding to be there for that family when they needed a spiritual influence. <laughs> Welcome to Faith in the Folds, a podcast for ministry, biblical studies, and Christian living. I'm your host, Kevin Burr. In today's episode, I sat down with friend and former student of mine, Jared Mays. Jared has been preaching for the Lemonster Church of Christ in Lemonster, Massachusetts for a few years now, and still remains active with the Caruso Experience, a camp for teenagers wanting to hone their preaching skills, hosted by Harding University, where Jared and I are both alumni. In the course of our conversation, Jared shared with me his love for preaching, how he's learned what preaching is really about, and the amazing power the church had for helping him endure his faith crisis. Jared is also probably the biggest Star Wars fan I know personally. Earlier in 2021, he, another friend from his church, and I started a Star Wars and Theology podcast called Hyperspace Theology, where we explore theological themes found in everyone's favorite galaxy far, far away. But even if you're like Freddie Mercury and you don't like Star Wars, I know you'll be blessed by what Jared has to say. If you enjoy the kinds of conversations we're having here on the podcast, would you be willing to like and subscribe to us? Maybe share us with someone that you think might benefit from this? And as always, thank you so much for tuning in today. Well, Jared, man, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I am glad that you're able to sit down with us for a different podcast than where you and I normally find ourselves, we'll we'll tease a little bit about that later. But um, before we get into kind of the main part of our conversation, I wanted to ask, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe where you went to school, where you're from, how long you've been doing ministry? Help us get to know you before we dig into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It is an absolute honor to get to talk to you, uh, especially coming on right after Dr. Manor, one of my very favorite professors from undergrad. Yeah. And um, so I'm looking forward to yeah. trying to try to fill his shoes. At um, the time of recording, yeah, er- earlier in the day, I had recorded a, a, a great interview with uh, Dale Manor. I think it's great. Uh, he enjoyed it. So we'll see. But uh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I love Dr. Manor. I have been in ministry for, let's see, 2013, 2021, almost almost eight years, uh, okay. full-time ministry, graduated from Harding in 2013. I'm originally from Russellville, Arkansas. My parents met through the campus ministry there, which is a fun story for another podcast. Yeah. And um, they, my dad ended up working for Arkansas Tech, our alma mater's biggest rivals, I have to mention. Um, Ooh, watch out. <laughs> amazing that I ended up at Harding after my parents watch are out. both tech grads. But yeah. uh, after that, I remember being... What, five years old when we had the Harding Chorus come and visit and our congregation would host, you know, two or three students in our homes mm-hmm. and, you know, nothing against state schools, but 
my dad has always been an administrator in, in state schools with, and we would intentionally as a family reach out to, you know, the roughest of the rough kids um, and bring them in, give them a home, um, a second family. My dad especially was great at evangelizing students mm -hmm. and taking them in, especially through like the fraternity that he was involved with. So then when these Harding students came, I was like, oh, these guys are just nicer. They're just <laughs> <laughs> better behaved they're more wholesome they care about the bible they're christians yeah. Yeah. and i remember listening to them sing i was big into that as well and thinking like well they're so amazing i'd love to be in the harding chorus uh it was like can i can i be a preacher if i go to harding and they're like yeah you can actually major in bible i was like i can major <laughs> in bible who knew right? and that was that was pretty much a sealed deal at that point when to be in ministry you know you, you get asked a lot as a kid what do you want to be when you grow up and you get like a lot of firefighter doctor lawyer, um, superhero, um, yeah. pro baseball player was on my list for a while. That's a pretty lucrative career. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one injury and it's over. Right. And then I remember our, uh, our preacher, Dan Lightfoot was his name, a sunset guy. And he was talking about, um, making an eternal difference. And mm. I remember being five years old, drawing a picture of him during worship and going after going up to him afterwards saying, I want to be like you when I grow up. And, you know, there's been a few detours um, along the way. I got into heavy metal music in high school. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm not laughing at you. I, I'm laughing in shock because I really, I really didn't know that about you. Oh, yeah. Hey, after the episode, I'll tell you the name of my band. I'm not sure I should even say it on air. Um, <laughs> I've okay. actually gotten gotten back into playing bass, so that's been fun as like a musical thing. But yeah. yeah, I know along the way it was like, maybe we'll tour the country and jam. And then I was like, you know what? Actually, I got a pretty good thing going here with uh, – 75% tuition discount at Harding. I might just want to follow that through. And I'm glad that I did. <laughs> glad that I did. When I, you know, yeah. freshman at Harding really changed my perspective on the Bible and, and how I viewed um, the larger Christian fellowship and, and who is a Christian and who's not. And the, the kind of, it was honestly, I remember reading through the Gospels my second semester at Harding under um, Dr. Neller, the late great Dr. Yeah. Neller. Yeah. And I remember being shocked to feel like I related more to the Pharisees than I did to Jesus. Mm. And that was the point of no return. I, I wanted to be a different person at that yeah. point. And, and I'm grateful that uh, Harding was that environment to kind of workshop that. Uh, we lived in Oklahoma for eight years. My dad worked at the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma, then moved back to Arkansas, lived mm -hmm. in Searcy starting in 2006, um, lived there for um, nearly 10 years. And uh, now I'm in Lemonster, Massachusetts, in the greater Boston area. Okay. Yeah. Um, when did you start at Harding? When did you start as a freshman? Fall of 2010. Oh, um, man. You and I just barely missed each other. <laughs> yeah. Because I was, I had wrapped up my, uh, my first master's degree. I said this before. Um, the reason why I got two master's, degree, master's degrees is not because I, I felt like I was, um, I felt like I needed them. Um, like infinity stones. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Private school is an expensive place to find yourself. <laughs> and so uh, that, that's kind of what I was doing in the, with the first master's degree, which wrapped up in the summer of 2010. So I just barely missed you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was fun was when I went to HST, um, I think my first semester was your last semester. And you were, for people that don't know, Kevin was a staple of the HST <laughs> library. You walk in, you say hi to Bob, Bob Turner, you say hi to Kevin, and then you get to work. Because Kevin, <laughs> you were always stationed right there at that desk. And, yeah. Um, you know, it was, you, you made me feel welcome at HST, I'll say that much. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, and that was where I remember meeting you is when you would come in, because you were still living in Searcy at the time, right? Yeah, actually, my, my last semester of undergrad, I would commute with my best friend, Carrie Verner, to Memphis once a week. I didn't have classes, oh, Tuesday morning or Thursday morning, whatever day it was. And um, he was having trouble making the drive at 5 a.m. To, oh, yeah. to Memphis. And I needed, I was working on some tough papers for um, Dr. Odin, Dan Odin, straight off his PhD, yeah. was really All just right. uh, taking it out on us undergrads. <laughs> and so I just like needed a better library. So we'd commute to campus with Carrie, uh, trying to get a jump start on grad school really just enjoyed yeah. once I just discovered you know, how much fun it was to be in chapel with the HST students and um, I just I just enjoyed going this bonding time for us as friends too yeah 
Yeah. That can be a tough drive early in the morning too, but to wake up at five yeah. for class at eight. Yeah. Cause you shout you're out really to highway 64. <laughs> yeah. Eastern Arkansas running through there. Yeah. Well, Jared, man, at, uh, we've gotten a little bit to know you. You've been, uh, been in ministry for about eight years or so. And, um, you mentioned, you mentioned when you graduated and when you started Harding School of Theology, where are you in your program now? Well, nearly, nearly done. Um, I still need to take my Greek um, advanced placement exam. I need to do that before yeah. August. It's nearly July now. Right. I need to do that before August. <laughs> Kevin was my Greek teacher the last couple of semesters. I audited to try to catch back up. And then I need to take Greek readings with Dr. Oster mm-hmm. and then advanced New Testament exegesis. Advanced with Dr. exegesis, yeah, which is a Greek-based exegesis class. With Dr. Black, and then I'll be done. So, so I'm in the okay. middle of a class. I've just got a paper left to write, um, and then so so two classes, two classes. Oh, Lord wow. willing, is, is that everybody it? listening? Say a prayer for me. I've been working on this thing for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> you and a lot of other folks uh, have taken taken not 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 slow because of lack of skills or anything like that but necessarily a deliberate pace because uh, like like you mentioned you've been in full-time ministry now for yeah. for a while in that time in full-time ministry where you've been it, you really had one foot in the school and uh, kind of one foot uh, firmly planted in church work mm-hmm. How have you grown during that time? What what are some things maybe that you can look back on and say, man, I've I've learned this or that valuable lesson during my during my short time in ministry. Short compared to guys like Jim Martin who have been there for forty years and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, my eight years is gonna go by in five minutes here. Um, I mean, you've been been doing it longer than I have, right? <laughs> That's cool to think about. All right. Yeah. Um, you know, preaching is what I've always wanted to do. I've loved preaching since I was a kid. We had such a great preacher in Chickasha, Oklahoma, where I grew up. His name was Steve Parker. He, he was a fiery preacher. Like, even when he was preaching love one another, like, you were going to quake in your boots. And I do mean <laughs> boots because this was western Oklahoma and everybody wore cowboy <laughs> boots. Um, he he had this passion and uh, was, was not like a preacher you could sleep through. Mm-hmm. And... I remember just sitting in the like second or third row in this massive building where we had in Oklahoma, just always glued to him. Like I would not move a muscle. My eyes were wide open. I just all throughout the week was just looking forward to going back to church to hear another sermon from this guy. And so I just love listening to him preach. That for me was so formative in thinking about um, yeah. kind of kind of preacher I wanted to be. I'm not the same preacher that, that he was though. And um, that's the glory of God. I, um, of course, appreciate what I grew up with, um, you know, loved some of the preachers that um, I got to listen to in college. I grew up going to a preacher training camp in Oklahoma City. I know what you're thinking, like, oh, that sounds nerdy. I went to football camp growing up. <laughs> well, I did football camp too, but our minister, retired minister in Oklahoma, Jim Shearer, he told me he had a, a guy who was once his intern, Tim Lewis, in Oklahoma City at the North MacArthur Church of Christ, was starting a preacher training camp, and he said, I'll pay your way to go. Well, then we ended up moving that summer. I couldn't do it. Next year, I called him back. I was like, I actually would still really love to go to that. Uh, you still can offer up those 50 bucks? And <laughs> so uh, my parents you know, drove me in six hours to attend this, and I remember realizing you know, at age 15, 16, that there were other kids my age who had their sights locked in on ministry and didn't just want to be another teenager in the youth group who um, had this shared passion. So I really loved getting to know the other students, the other mentors um, at that camp were able to invest in me and nurture me and guide me. And they didn't make fun of me for (laughs) thinking I was the best preacher at preacher training camp. They didn't temper my passion. They just walked with me patiently. And I'm so grateful for that. Well, after that, you know, at Harding, I helped start one, the Caruso Experience. We can talk about mm-hmm. that more in a minute. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Cox and Dr. McClarty both really believed in it, helped um, helped see that through to fruition. And so I spent, you know, a couple of years trying to encourage high schoolers to become preachers, and then I became one. And then I started thinking, like, do I really want to encourage teenage boys to become preachers after <laughs> the horrors that I've gone through this is so much harder than I ever realized uh-huh. and the answer is yes yes I still do this I still believe in it um, I'm still passionate about it though my perception of preaching is different than it once was I'll, I'll say okay. that 
uh, initially I was in love with the art of crafting a sermon, studying right. the Bible, delivering yeah. a fiery message with good delivery skills. And, yeah. Um, the art of having the exact right story or joke at the exact right time and then the big twist ending and yeah. inductive and deductive preaching and helping people discover a book of the Bible they've never read before through good preaching. I still believe in all of that, but it was very, very quickly into full-time ministry that I came to realize that's only a small piece of what is right. involved in yeah. being a preacher. Right. Specifically, it's about investing in people's lives, walking with through walking with them through the joys in life, having a baby, getting married, graduating high school, but as well as walking through the horrors of of losing a loved one. Um, did a funeral for a a one week old baby a couple of years ago. Um, and that was one of the most cherished moments in all of my ministry. It was mm -hmm. excruciatingly difficult, but so rewarding to be there for that family when they needed a spiritual influence. Um, so, so the big lessons that I've learned is to invest in people, people who are different from you, people who agitate you. Sometimes those are the best <laughs> people to get to know the, the people you can have the most impact on because you can grow too. I'm dealing with that even right now at church, um, a little bit of friction with a guy and we're sticking it out with each other. We, yeah. we had it out in a tough argument and you know what exposure therapy, <laughs> or we are still around each other. We're still getting to know each other, um, giving each other benefit of the doubt, second chances, asking clarifying questions, not writing each other off. And God's doing a good work through that. So, so I'd say the number one lesson that I learned was the importance of letting God do his work through people yeah. to, to love people more than preaching. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. I like how you've worded that. Yeah. Because I think a lot of folks, especially a lot of, um, a lot of folks in uh, in college who are expecting maybe to go to um, go on and, and be ministers, I think a lot of them do have this idea that you have, where mm -hmm. you know when they think about preaching, they think about the performative act, right? You're you're crafting the sermon, right? You're honing your rhetorical skills, and not to say that that is not genuine or anything like that. <clears throat> Performances can can very much be genuine. And, you know, there's a performative aspect to preaching, but I think a lot of folks, uh, especially young folks who think about ministry, especially preaching, they don't know that there's really a focus. You need to have a real focus on people. Um, right. Jesus was a master teacher, but Jesus, um, you know, Jesus was constantly around people, investing in them working mm -hmm. with them, training them. His, the most powerful moments with Jesus in the Gospels are not his sermons, though I love them. The most powerful moments with Jesus in the Gospels are him one-on-one -on -one with somebody nobody wants to deal with. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about um, loving people more than the sermon. This is so important in the sense that um, people can tell. <laughs> people can tell if, if what you're doing is just a show. Mm -hmm. They can see through it if you're putting on a performance and you're not being authentic, you're not being genuine. Yeah. I'll think about one of the the most power, a couple of the most powerful sermons I preached in the sense of I could see people's response, not just right there while I was preaching, but afterward and for weeks, were when I was either struggling through something and had a breakdown in the pulpit and like physically could not continue to preach, or or if I was sick. You know, I remember getting out one time, I just did not feel well, but. I was going to do my job. I was, I had something, the Lord had something to say that week. And, mm -hmm. and um, regardless of how I felt, sometimes you got to go to work and do the thing that you don't feel like doing. Cause that's what it is to be an adult. <laughs> and yeah. um, you can't just call in sick like you can in school. Right. So I remember getting up to preach and afterward, I just, it didn't have the same passion. I try, like try to convey enthusiasm when I preach. I remember one of the elders saying that was one of your best sermons. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous because <laughs> Like I could barely even preach. I could barely talk. And he's like, maybe right. that's why you were authentic. You were genuine. You were subdued. Um, it clearly was not just about putting on a show. And I came to realize there, oh, maybe maybe there's more to preaching than just delivery. Mm. Can yeah. I share a couple more lessons? Please do, yeah. Yeah, I've got another one here. I'm sitting and, here reflecting on that thinking, man, yeah, that's, that's really hitting me. Thinking about my time when I was preaching more regularly uh, about a year or so ago in, in Kentucky. But yeah, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, share. Yeah, I need to look up some of your sermons. I've never heard you preach. Um, they're available online. Do you know? 
Uh, yes, they are. Uh, my oh. most recent one is uh, is on our uh, King's Crossing Church of Christ uh, YouTube channel. You can find I preached about my dog. <laughs> That's good. cool. Perfect. That's it. Always Basically, works. Yeah. Can never go wrong with a dog illustration. A good dog sermon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but uh, what else? What else have you learned? So invest in people. What else? Secondly, and this relates to this conflict I'm going with, going through with this this brother. Yeah. And that is what you say isn't always what people hear. <laughs> Even if you have the best intentions, and if you feel like you have righteous intentions, yeah. Sometimes that can be perceived if you just use the right trigger word it can be perceived as uh, villainy. And so it's important to be clear. It's important to live a faithful life that can underscore your preaching and to put deposits in the trust bank, especially with the people that you don't see eye to eye with, let's say politically, for example. Ah, yeah. Put those deposits in the trust bank so that they will be less willing to write you off and scream at you. Not not so much that you, like, you don't want to be screamed at. That's not fun. More importantly, you don't want to alienate people from – the the lord's body right mm -hmm. and if your unintentional subtext um is not what you mean to say it can still be what people perceive and so uh, one of the things i've had to learn along the way is like if you preach a sermon on um let's say the the freedom in christ you might want to do a sermon about uh about a good biblical command to reinforce the fact that you're not lawless you know <laughs> so it, it's just important to realize yeah. Just because you've typed it on a paper and you've written a good sermon doesn't mean that people are going to hear a good sermon. And and to reinforce that point, I'll say sometimes the sermons I like the least as a preacher are still sermons that connect the most with the body. And mm -hmm. so I appreciate the fact when I've preached a sermon and I finish it and I'm during the invitation song, I'm beating myself up and people don't know it. I appreciate it when afterward there's that one little old lady who says that's exactly what I needed to hear today. Not because I liked the pats on the back. No, I do. Let's be honest. Sure. Yeah. But because it reminds me God was doing something through that sermon, even yeah. if you dropped the ball or feel like you did. Yeah. That's humbling, too, because to know that even mm -hmm. when I either mess up or don't, I, I, I'm forcibly reminded in those moments that the power to convict and inspire and encourage is not mine. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not up to me. The time that I got the most in trouble, uh, un undeservedly so I'll, I'll add undeservedly. So <laughs> was uh, when I was teaching a Bible class and um, someone, someone did not hear what, uh, what I said, they, they heard what they thought I said. And, uh, it, it it ended up not going very well. Sure. And um, it didn't didn't end up going very well afterwards for a while either. So, and, and that's a part of ministry. It that is. is a part of ministry, and that's one of the things that I knew I was signing up for. Mm -hmm. And when it happens in the heat of the confrontation, I'm thinking to myself, I can handle this. I knew this was this came with the territory. And so there's so much of ministry that is just about having conflict. But the good news about having conflict in ministry is it means that um, means there's heat. It means that something's cooking, right? Um, it would be better to have conflict with people who are passionate about the church or about um, whatever particular subject you're teaching on than to have people who are apathetic, who will never conflict with you. Um, I, I view it as a, a good sign whenever there's conflict. You don't want conflict every week, but when it when it does happen, it says, "Well, we can work with this. Yeah, um, we can cook something." That's a, that's a healthy perspective. I like I said, and, and you're right to kind of nuance that. You don't want conflict every week, um, but it is. I can see how it would be. It's helpful for every once in a while somebody to get kind of shaken up and stirred up a little bit, and maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe that allows them, maybe after they've had a chance to cool off, maybe that allows them a little bit of opportunity to reflect uh, for themselves on yeah. some of that stuff. I know it certainly does on me, and I have to make sure that, you know, that, I, that I didn't actually accidentally say you know, whatever you know, hurtful or offensive or rude or inappropriate thing that I may have been That's accused right. of or whatever. So, yeah. yeah, you have to analyze if somebody's criticizing you. You have to take their words to heart. If you're just dismissive, that's irresponsible and arrogant. If, if you only focus on their criticism, though, 
you can beat yourself up unnecessarily. Yeah. Sometimes people project. And so you've got to take what they've said to heart, but then you've got to hold on to yourself. And that's the third lesson that I wanted to share yeah. is one of the things I had to learn in ministry was how to hold on to myself throughout uh, this rigorous cycle. Hey, Sunday comes every seven days. Sometimes it feels like it's every two or three days. <laughs> and if you are the full-time preacher preaching a sermon, sometimes two sermons, sometimes two sermons and two Bible classes, <laughs> you know, I've been there uh, certain, certain uh, quarters in my life. I'm doing mm -hmm. all four. Yeah. You've got to find a way to hold on to yourself, both with your spiritual growth, study a book of the Bible that you love, something that's second nature for you, something that you are passionate about that does does not take the most preparation every week. Because then, like, if, if you're doing four things each week of content right. that you're preparing, you yeah. can't be with people. So you've yeah. got to find a way to be with people, both Christians and non-Christians. Let me say so much of my ministry every day at least every week, is about intentionally seeking friendships with non-believers. So, so that, that could be a, another episode. But um, hold on to yourself. Find a way to stay sane. Find a way mm -hmm. to take care of your physical health. Um, you know, I go running, and uh, you got to find ways, find ways to um, detox from stress, find ways to get some movement, especially if you're a preacher. That's a lot of, a lot of uh, seat in the chair time. And so right. – um, that's that's been so important. Find something that you're passionate about that is working a different side of your brain. You know, I love Star Wars, and this is something we have in common, Kevin. We yeah. Um, now I've got a, a community with Utini that I write and podcast for, where we're talking Star Wars, and I get a chance to share my faith there regularly. But it's primarily just, hey, we're going to talk about this ridiculous, uh, fantastical universe that we all love. Mm -hmm. That's wholesome. And um, we can do so in such a way so as to flex, you know, creativity muscles. And um, you've got to find a way when people criticize you, even if you're, if you're dealing with some tough conflict in ministry to, to find joy in life. You can't just mm -hmm. agonize over the conflict all the time. You know, find a way to be able to just love and play with your kids. If you've got kids, I, you know, I've got a couple little girls and if I take out my ministry anxieties on them, yeah, what is that going to tell them about the church? Yeah. And so uh, it's important to me to make sure that my kids know that I love church and to help my kids love church. Yeah, man, that is, <laughs> There's, there's so much there. There's so much there. I I was uh, I, I was tracking every every bit with that because you know, a, a lot of sort of what I've experienced in ministry has uh, I was not necessarily preparing to do. Sure. Because I kind of I, I kind of came into ministry as, unexpectedly. Right. Um, I mean, you know, when I. When I was ramping up at HST, when you were just starting over there, I was getting my MDiv. I had, um, I'd been accepted to a doctoral program, and uh, you know, I was, I, I was bound and determined. It's like I'm, I'm gonna do what I can to teach at one of our, uh, you know, one of our sister schools in undergraduate yeah. Bible, and they're like, that's that's, that's what I would, that that was sort of my identity. Like that is where I was envisioning myself going with that, and it was. Um, it was about a year and a half into my doctoral program that I realized, okay, I'm likely to have an opportunity to do some congregational ministry. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be training, if I'm going to be studying all of this Bible that I'm studying, I need to, I need to find a real outlet to be able to share a lot yeah. of this stuff. I, I, That's right. I eventually had the opportunity to, to work as kind of a co-part-time minister with a friend of mine, Garrett Best, in, yeah. uh, in, at a church in central Kentucky. And what I, I started describing it to friends as it's sort of a, a sacred duty and a, and a holy obligation to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to serve in a, in a congregation like this. And what I, what I realized was, oh, yeah, the joys and anxieties of ministry that I hear all my friends talk about, they actually happen to me too. I'm not just going to skirt around this kind of uh -huh. stuff. Right. It's been, it's been quite a learning experience. It really right. has. And Absolutely. I like how you put this hold on to yourself. I didn't come up with that. I, I'll give credit to one of my mentors, Mike Cope. Um, he runs a, uh, a cohort through the Lily grants. Um, 
Pepperdine sponsors it. And so there's a cohort of us, 15 ministers in New England. We've met together for the last year and a half. So it's be a one-year thing. So thanks, COVID, for stretching this out into multiple <laughs> years. Yeah. Uh, but Mike Cope has been such a good mentor to me. And that's been one of our lessons is <laughs> through that cohort is how to hold on to yourself through congregational anxiety and, you know, a global pandemic, as well as sure. uh, just the, the regular ins and outs of of being a spiritual guide for people that you're going to have your own spiritual crises as well and uh, can't let people drag you down into the depths of despair um if you can have joy in ministry it can be contagious it's not always but it can be so yeah i gotta give him credit on that one well good good that uh that'd be neat to be neat to get him on podcast sub time to kind of dig into oh that yeah that'd you be, absolutely should he would be great that'd be fun um one thing that i and I, I don't know if this is maybe a healthy practice but one thing that i've found myself doing more often uh whenever i run into any kind of criticism of something that i've done or something that i've said which thankfully is is not often right uh, uh, thankfully it's not often but yeah right i've <laughs> no, seriously um but whenever I, when I do encounter something like that, I've noticed that I take a quick stock. It's like, okay, um, all right. So somebody said this and they, they either thought this about what I was doing or they said this about something that I did or said. It's like, all right, um, who are the people that are closest to me that know me the best that also have some perspective on either my work or my person or something along those lines? All right, what are those friends who know me best? What do they say? How would they respond in this situation? Would they, uh, would they give me some mm-hmm. grace when That's good I, advice. I I mentioned the um, I mentioned earlier I was teaching Bible class, said something that uh, apparently someone thought um, thought that I had said something just e- egregiously inappropriate for any Christian to say, and uh, had some very strong words with me after class about that. But um, I asked others in the audience uh, very quietly you know, without, without naming names or anything like that. Just afterwards, I was like, hey, when I said X, did you hear why? And they're like, well, no, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. I asked a couple of folks that people whose opinions I had trusted. You mentioned yeah. you know, deposits in the trust bank uh, earlier. Right. Um, people that I had built up those relationships and friendships with. And they helped help kind of ground me a lot more quickly. Because I sure. could have just been sort of floating, thinking, "Oh man, like, is this really what everybody thinks about me?" Mm-hmm. No, it, it wasn't. It was it was pretty useful. I I don't know if that's maybe the healthiest practice because it it could turn into, well, he said, but she said, and stuff like that. Yeah, or an echo chamber of people who tell you what you want to hear. You no, know, but that is it could is healthy. Yeah. The, the church can can be a counterbalance. You know, you can have, and this is important that the church is diverse, that the church is diversity of opinions, diversity of beliefs within a range of orthodoxy, right? right um, yeah. and, and of course, uh, racial diversity, gender diversity, age diversity. You want to have people who will tell you what you don't want to hear and also people who can say, hey, hang in there, hold your head up, um, carry on, brother. And I'm grateful for the people in my journey along the way who have served as those those redirecting guideposts to get me back on the track. Yeah. One of the things that we wanted to talk about today was um, a big crisis that I had a number of years ago. Yeah. I really had, you know, f- lost my faith for the um, for the most part. If we want to look at it that way, and, and I, think, I think it's important for folks to know that as, as you said that, right? You you feel like you know, kind of functionally at least, maybe you had lost faith. You were also serving in ministry, right? During that yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what happened. And, and this is to lead up to the point where there was one person in particular, and I was already re- reshaping my faith. God was reshaping my faith, but mm-hmm. one person in particular who came alongside me at the right time, who was a listening ear, who was able to say, I've gone through something similar, and he handed me a book, right? And so um, that absolutely was the turning point and all of that. Yeah, what happened was I'd been in full-time ministry for two and a half years, 25 years old, was um, being called by this church up here in new england to come and serve we had agreed to do so and two weeks before the move my mom who was 50 um was gonna have a pacemaker put in for her heart heart problems and didn't survive the procedure i mom had mom had had poor health all throughout you know junior high and high school 
but it never really crossed my mind that she could die prematurely. Yeah. I think it maybe in hindsight, I should have prepared myself for that emotionally, spiritually, practically better than I did. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was raised in this Christian bubble that said, God is on your side. And if you pursue righteousness, um, you're going to have a joyful life. It was in some, some ways kind of like the book of Job, right? I just mm -hmm. believed that uh, the power of positive thinking and a, a good Christian family and uh, optimism was going to <laughs> land me with a, uh, you know, a blessed marriage and a happy yeah. family. And, and that is just not always the way it works. Tragedy is one of the big lessons I've learned in ministry is tragedy is just a part of everyone's lives in different ways at different points in time. Mm -hmm. At the time I was preaching through Romans 8, this, I kid you not, the sermon I preached the Sunday before mom died was, what verse is that in Romans 8? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. And I had the, I got this idea from Rick Ashley. Um, I had the audience, the congregation, everybody turn to their neighbor and say, God is for you. <laughs> and I believe that. I still think like that was a perfectly fine rhetorical tool to reinforce the lesson of Romans 8. God is for you. I didn't really fully explore the implications of what happens when you can know without a shadow of a doubt that God is for you because you are a part of the inheritance of, through the blood of his son. You have um, life in Christ, freedom in Christ. What happens when you can know that God is for you and it feels like he's against you? Hmm. What it felt like in that moment, those first few months, first couple years, honestly, after mom died was it felt like God was against me. Um, it felt like it was a divine prank that I had preached that and then had experienced this horrible tragedy. What I came to realize was everybody experiences tragedy. This was my time to bear this burden. It was my turn to carry this baton. This was not being divinely singled out. And in fact, as I a couple of years later would be preaching a funeral for a baby, a family who had lost their newborn, I realized, you know, in some ways, my tragedy can't compare to the, the, the hurts that other people carry on a daily basis. You can't see them. You don't know what people are going through. And that was just totally not on my radar. Like I knew theoretically, yeah, everybody has to deal with suffering and you need to be faithful anyway. But until it was my turn to bear that burden. Yeah. So immediately after my mom died, I relocated across the country away from family starting a new job as people's spiritual mentor. And, and I just felt so absolutely, utterly, horribly lost. And when you, when you no longer believe in God, and I'm not sure I ever was at that point as much as I believed in God and I believed in a God who had turned his back on me. Mm -hmm. And, but when, when you find yourself in that kind of a position, it's, it's so disorienting in more ways than you can imagine because the rug is pulled out from under you. Your foundation for living a godly life, a, a virtuous life, a joyful life is gone. Yeah. And so I, I, I lost myself. Thankfully, though, the church saw me in my tragedy and they were patient with me. They sent flowers, you know, across the country. All you have to do is call, you know, and – <laughs> with a credit card number sure. to, to yeah. send flowers, but it was, it meant a lot to have this little, you know, big um, pot of flowers show up my, at my parents' doorstep a couple of days after mom died saying from the Lemonster church of Christ, people I didn't know yet who said, we see you in this and we love you and we're here for you. <clears throat> the elders picked up the slack for me the first six months, helping teach Bible class, helping with the bulletin as I just was like a deer in the headlights. I was in a haze and they could see it, but they yeah. didn't criticize me for it. They got to know me. They nurtured me. And over time, I came to realize these people in the pew that I'm preaching to, they're all holding a burden that's not so different from what I'm holding. People have all had their divorces, their estranged children, their financial troubles, um, mm -hmm. their lost loved ones, uh, addictions, addictions of loved ones that are, cause a burden on them every day. Uh, and I just came to realize 
what it was to have empathy as a part of preaching. And it was, of course, uh, Nathan Guy. You, um, I, I don't know if you know Dr. Guy. Yeah. I know um, Nathan. It was I'm... in coming back to work at uh, Caruso a couple of years after my mom died that I got the chance to ride with him to a 4th of July cookout. And he talked to me about life and ministry. And I told him about, I just felt so lost and was working on my faith. And I felt like I had a faith, but it was weaker. In some ways, it was stronger, <laughs> but it felt weaker. And he talked to me about what it was for him to deal with something very similar. He said for me, the book that really helped turn things around was A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis. He mm -hmm. gave me his copy. Um, I took it home. I It's tough. It's tough. It's a messy read. It's not C.S. Lewis' most well-organized, beloved, um, profound book in the sense of he's crafting a huge narrative as much as it's a, <laughs> it's a prayer journal of somebody who's dealing with suffering. Yeah. It's, it's no Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> Have you have you read it? I have not. I've read um, I, I've read part of a similar work by a guy who is who was an influence on C.S. Lewis, this old Scottish preacher named George MacDonald. Okay, um, who wrote uh, what's called a Diary of an Old Soul? It's just every day for a year. It's a, a kind of a, a poetic reflection on on grief. And actually, the title for the podcast, Faith in the Fold, comes from a particular day's stanzas where he oh, he says basically he doesn't see any faith in his heart. And all he has that he can do is just uh, uh, cling to obedience. That's it. Wow. Wow. I didn't know it doesn't, that. It doesn't, doesn't seem like it was too different from your experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and C.S. Lewis, uh, of course, had um, married later in life to his wife, Helen, who died, what, two years after they finally married. So he talks about how he had finally found the love of his life and they shared such wonderful love together. And then she was taken from him. And so he's just writing about life and faith in in the midst of grief. And that was therapeutic. But most importantly, he he came up with this, this one section, one page that just really was the, <laughs> the, the light turning on for me in rediscovering my faith, which was this, he says, I would take her place if I could. And I had said that a hundred times. Actually, I'd said, I'd wish that this other um, person would take her place. How come, it how, come, how come these wicked people in my life are still alive and mom is gone? And, I, and, and Lewis says, I would take her place if I could. And then in writing it, he immediately says, but that's absurd. I can't. There's, I don't get that right. Uh, I don't have that option. We would all say that theoretically, but we can never mean it, that you would take somebody's place because it's always an afterthought. It's always good intentions. It's self-righteousness is what it is. And he says, you know what? Actually, that's not true. There's one who could take her place, and he did. And God took the weight of sin and death and suffering on his shoulders to deal with it, not just for one person, but once and for all. Yeah. And that for me was everything. Um, it was not my favorite book I've ever read. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's 80 pages of torture, but it was um, so important for me in realizing that's true. And that's where my faith lies. It's no longer on the things that it once was on. Um, my faith looks so different than it did before experiencing suffering before having doubt interwoven into my faith. But um, it is now so much more based on Jesus, on the resurrection. And I think rightly so. I think that's a good move to make. Um, yeah. But it can't, it can't happen artificially. Yeah. I've been, I've been fortunate enough not to lose very many people, anyone to death who was very close to me no one in my immediate family yet my I praise god my folks are still here uh, both brothers uh but i did have um have an especially meaningful experience man i right around the time that i would have either after i would have met you or um uh, right around then at least in uh, 2013 um, my, my nephew, um, my 
the the son of my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, so my mm-hmm. wife's uh, brother and his wife. They uh, they found out um, fairly early on into her pregnancy that um, that their little one was not going to make it, mm-hmm. and um, they uh, doctor said that he probably live an hour, and uh, God God graced us with two hours. Yeah, with him, and um, that was a pretty significant time in my life because. Um, I was I was still relatively newly married. Got married in 2012. That had happened in 2013. Yeah. And Jared, I don't I don't know if you've experienced this. I, I suspect you have, because uh, you are late 20s. Is that right? Yeah, I'm 29. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and you've been married for uh, eight years. Eight yeah, years. we, we okay. get married young in the Harding bubble. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> And it's, it's almost like a cultural thing, right? It's like mm-hmm. people who grow up with a church context and go to those kinds of schools um, do tend to get married a little bit sooner than, than a lot of folks are roughly our age. But you and I are are of the age and have been married long enough to where uh, our friends are old enough to get married and start realizing that that they can't just easily have children. Yeah. And it's, I I never realized how common that was. Never realized how devastating that could be. Um, You know, my wife and I never had, didn't have trouble Mm -hmm. with that, but we've had, we've had enough friends to where you sit down and think, my goodness, how does, how does this even happen? Enough friends who'd had trouble. And so I I was like, kind of right then, it was like, I was beginning, I was married. And so I, I was suddenly seeing married life and family life, you know, firsthand. And had had a not an experience like what my brother-in-law and sister-in-law had. I, I I can't I can only observe that I I didn't experience it for myself. But had had a moment where I had to sit down and and think, how man, how on earth do you do you continue, right, when something like this happens for you? The church played a vital role. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. On the one hand, my local congregation, where I was preaching at the time, uh, South Arkansas, McGee, Arkansas, half that church drove up to my mother's visitation, and I had already quit on them. I was already out the door. Yeah. yeah. And they came, and they were there, and they wouldn't have missed it for the world. Yeah. And, uh, the church where I'm at now, they walked me through it in a very culturally different way. <laughs> Such an sure. incredibly different culture in New England than what we had in. They didn't shower you, know, you with casseroles and stuff. Southern hospitality, <laughs> no, no. But they they're well acquainted with suffering and with hardship. And as we've had you know, a dozen funerals of beloved members since I've been here, preaching funerals when you are well acquainted with grief it is more meaningful for people. So God's been able to minister through that suffering, through that crisis, through that grief. And I'm grateful for that. And um, I wouldn't have wished for it in the first sure. place, but it was my turn. And uh, I'm, I'm able to be there for others as it's their turn. Um, and then also the church at large, thinking about outside of just our local individual churches but Mm -hmm. you know dr guy who was a harding professor who i never had who uh, eventually went on to mars hill bible college who just so happened to you know still be around that summer before he ended up taking a new job and uh, just was going to attend the fourth of july cookout you know he wasn't on staff at caruso he just said jerry would you like to ride with me and uh, that car ride changed my life and so it's one of the things i love about the way god works in the world is Growing up, I think with my ultra conservative background, it was God works and communicates through the Bible. End of story. And since I've been in ministry, I've seen how God is working in the here and now through people, through his spirit. Whether it's people who confront you, as we talked about conflict yeah. for the first half of the episode, or or people who can encourage you and give you a pat on the back when you need it, or um, people who can say, I'll listen. 
Oh, I've been there too. And here's what worked for me. And God is good, <laughs> even through suffering. And um, it's one of those things that, that I underestimated was the power of, of God's witness in the church on an ongoing basis beyond simply uh, being revealed through the ancient written word, which like, don't get me wrong. You know, I love the Bible, uh, Yeah. but uh, what, what good would yeah. that be if it weren't for people to share it with? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to keep in mind that for a lot of folks, when tragedy strikes, a lot of Christians, surprisingly, when tragedy strikes, they will often, for whatever reason, withdraw from yeah. withdraw from church. And I think that that's a real tragedy. And it, 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 I think that can compound the tragedy mm-hmm. because whatever tragedy they experienced was obviously significant enough you know, for them to make some kind of change. I think you compound that tragedy when you step away from the people that God has intentionally placed in your life to be able to work, you know, work his healing through you. And we're all broken healers in one way or another, Mm -hmm. but I, that's one of the things that, that makes me sad. It's my very first interview uh, for the podcast, um, which debuted uh, beginning in March or 2021. Had to think for a second what year we're in. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I feel like everybody's still talking about 2020. Um, was with uh, with a gentleman who's um, a guy named John Nichols, who's a minister in Cookville, Tennessee, which is uh, part of Tennessee that got devastated by the tornadoes in 2020. And um, a family friend of um, of his, you know, lost a little one, lost a daughter, and mm-hmm. um, the church. It, he didn't. He didn't. Um, yeah, this family friend didn't withdraw from church. He was a minister in in one of the churches there. And he didn't withdraw. Yeah. They were sad. They were devastated. They were ab- dumbfounded. But the church was able to work its healing. Yeah. And the church is good at that. Hey, church has got plenty of problems. Sure. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of things for us to work on. But um, we're loving. You know, the church is a people of, of yeah. love. And they will rise up to the occasion when given the opportunity to help and to show compassion. And uh, if that compassion looks like a casserole if it looks like a book um so if it's a pot of flowers uh, and that's one of the things i've loved about church and you know i'm really grateful we get the chance to talk about this because this is not something i've felt free to talk about this is something that has been so incredibly personal and i've had to fight back tears a few times in this episode um i as a minister have have been afraid especially those first couple of years to talk about my faith crisis. But I think it's important that we are, as ministers, able to talk about the role that doubt plays in faith, mm-hmm. that faith and doubt are not polar opposites, that faith yeah. and doubt can coexist. I think about the father, is it in John, Mark 9? Where is this? Just edit this to make me sound like I know my Bible. <laughs> um, the father I, who says... I actually don't do a lot of editing on this. Uh, I believe, help me in my... Un- I don't do any editing, but yeah, go ahead. The, the father who says, uh, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Help me in my unbelief. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark 9, right? Yeah. Maybe not. I'll look it up. <laughs> um, help me in my unbelief. And so the idea there is you can have both, right? It doesn't have to be one or the other. Faith and doubt are not polar opposites. I think that faith and apathy are polar opposites. Mm-hmm. You're saying disengaging from church. That's the real danger is not experiencing doubt read the psalms there's plenty of doubt involved oh, in absolutely. faith it, it's and, hard to make your way through a single psalm without finding both right I'm, I'm writing this down faith and doubt are not polar opposites faith and apathy are yeah i think you're right to mention the psalms too because because the psalms are cries implicit in the cry is a cry to a god that you believe will hear you and will act mm-hmm. yeah apathy would be eh. and it right. could easily turn into uh, either hedonism or nihilism or something along those lines yeah yeah and i tried those a few weeks at a time and uh, they're paths to nowhere my friend absolute <laughs> paths to nowhere and I, I was like all right what about these other religions let's try those out and uh i found to be completely devoid of life and hope 
um, as well to, to think about Christianity being the only major world religion that says it's God is love. And we could then have an apologetic to test that as we think about the existence of the empty tomb, the validity of the resurrection, the historical reality of the resurrection. Yeah. And for me, that's where my faith came to rest. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I love about getting to share this is I find new people in the Bible to relate to. I think about Thomas. And we talked about this yeah. some on Hyperspace Theology, our other podcast. We talked, we did an episode on doubt. And um, I think I mentioned this story there. One of the things I love about Thomas's story is the fact that eight days after, is it eight days after the resurrection? Or is it eight days after the crucifixion? Uh, I think Look it's it the next week after they they witness the they witnesses they witness the resurrected Jesus. But Thomas wasn't there. So Thomas right. missed out. You know, big day to sleep in, Thomas. <laughs> And he comes back and says, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Basically, yeah. I'll, unless I put my, unless I see the nail marks with his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, um, I won't believe. And then a week later, right, a week after the resurrection, that's right, Thomas was with them. And that sentence is overlooked to get to the next verse, verse John 20, 27, where in New England, this is the way we say it. Uh, he said to Thomas, put your finger here, right? <laughs> um, but the, the detail before that in verse 26 is a week after the resurrection, after Thomas has already expressed, yeah, right. He's still with the disciples. He's still in the community of faith. Yeah, And that's that's what is so beautiful about his story is – not that he's a doubter among the apostles that was bound to happen, but it's that he stays plugged in. He doesn't give up. And um, then he has an opportunity to be, to be witnessed to by the resurrected Jesus. And I think that's what happened with me in, in a different way. Um, mm. I couldn't quit church because it was my livelihood, but I would have if I could have at the time. Yeah. And yet I'm glad that God didn't make that a possibility, right? Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things we talked about on hyperspace theology. We could t probably talk about that another minute. We did an episode on doubt. Yeah, talked about uh, Han Solo's journey from doubter in yeah. A New Hope to uh, to you know in The Force Awakens, saying it's true, all of it. And uh, that's a good Han Solo. Yeah, just edit that impression <laughs> to make it sound like Harrison Ford. I'll, I'll plug in his actual audio. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this this other podcast that we've mentioned a couple of times here, hyperspace theology. It's a podcast where we basically explore theology and Christianity and uh, you know, spiritual things, through, like how you say in the podcast, through the lens of the galaxy far, far away. It has been uh, it, it's been a lot of fun being yeah. able to do uh, to do this episode, to do this uh, podcast with you and another gentleman from uh, Lemonster mm -hmm. up there, a guy who's a relatively new Christian. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I baptized Scott in 2017. Mm -hmm. and it's a yeah. fun dynamic on the show you a phd scott who's reading his bible through for the first time in yeah. some ways and um and then me i'm trying to just you know <laughs> go tether you guys together <laughs> no but it's uh it's it's never contentious it, it's it's always a lot of fun we um i think every episode either at least one or all of us comes away with thinking man you know i'd never thought about it. yeah that in that way before um one one episode that i i directed uh that i am particularly proud of was one of our i, I say one of our earlier episodes we have five out <laughs> as of now yeah it's, we'll it's a little five. bit of a slower roll than you've got going with you've really got a head of steam here with faith in the fold i i uh i, I picked up uh, i picked up pretty soon uh yeah in march but there's uh this one episode where we looked at just sort of the power the power of uh, of surrender uh, can have on people, and I, I drew some comparisons with you know there at the end of the Return of the Jedi, Luke uh, he doesn't just holster his lightsaber; he throws it away, he mm -hmm. tosses it aside, and uh, refuses to fight anymore. That act is sort of the culmination, or maybe the last straw for Vader coming to realize that. He loves his son more than he fears the emperor. Mm -hmm. And he, at the time, we thought, killed the emperor 
at least killed that iteration of the emperor if we're gonna <laughs> yeah we won't get into that take into account the uh, rise of skywalker but he kills the emperor and then but there, there's there's some quality of redemption that occurs through this act of surrender by luke through this uh, so the antagonist ha experiences some degree of redemption by an act of surrender by the protagonist we looked at uh, captain america um oh yeah i forgot about that Captain America and uh, it's uh, it's the Winter Soldier, Captain America and the Winter mm -hmm. Soldier, where Captain America is fighting the Winter Soldier there near the end, and um, he finally Cap throws down his shield. So I'm not gonna fight you anymore. You're my friend. Basically prompting Bucky, prompting the Winter Soldier, at the end of the movie to pull an unconscious Cap out of the river. Yeah, man, it's been a few years since I've seen that one. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, that did happen. And then you know, in, a, in a similar way, we see, we see Jesus surrender to the authorities in order to, in a theological sense, in order to redeem the rest of the antagonists, which were people who were formerly hostile to God. Yeah, yeah. It's like that, that was, that's a, that's the kind of stuff God. that we dig into in, yeah. in hyperspace theology. You had mentioned doubt and how um, uh, that was Scott's episode, right? Or was it yours? Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, wh whichever one of y'all directed that episode, it was fascinating to kind of walk through that where Han Solo, in, in, in the first Star Wars movie that came out, um, Star Wars A New Hope, Han Solo expresses some doubt that, you know, eh, you know, there's no mystical religion that directs near me. I've seen a lot of strange stuff in the galaxy. He goes from that and stays connected to this core group of people. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we get to The Force Awakens, which released a few years ago, we see him say, yeah, the stories you've heard of the Jedi, the Force, the dark side, it's true, all of it. Right. He's become a true believer. And I and the point that we made uh, in the episode, or one of the points that we really highlighted, was we he was a part of a a, a transformative community mm -hmm. that included in the story world people like Luke and Leia and others, and for a time, you know, a guy like Obi Wan Kenobi. But yeah, it's a neat podcast. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things I like about it is there's a little bit of something there for everybody. Uh, I've got friends who are Christians who, you know, very casual Star Wars fans, if at all, mm -hmm. who enjoy listening to it because they want to hear the Christian stuff. Sure. Uh, I've got friends who are not just non-Christians, but some of them even vocal atheists yeah. who listen to the show who want to hear that Star Wars side, you know, want to hear our perspective on our faith that we do care so greatly about and believe mm -hmm. in so deeply. And so that's one of the things I'm proudest of with the show is that we, it's it's been a show for uh, for both sets of people. Yeah, yeah. Jared, man, is there anything else that, uh, before we wrap up today, anything else that you kind of want to, you know, revisit anything you want to leave us with as we, uh, as we kind of wind, wind down today? I'm just grateful for the chance to talk about, in, in particular, uh, the faith crisis that I went through, because it is something that I have really not had much of a chance to share. It's not, I, I, I'll tell personal stories from the pulpit, but uh, you don't really want to treat the congregation like your therapists so yeah. i don't yeah. get up and talk about this often mm -hmm. or much not in this much detail for sure and so i'm grateful for the chance to share this if you listener uh, have struggled with your faith or know somebody who has i'd invite you to either share this with them or send them my way you know uh, you can email me my email address is jared at lemonster church of christ it's spelled uh, leo minster because massachusetts hey we all of our town names are crazy um jared at lemonster church of christ you know you can email me I, i'll talk to you about uh whatever faith crisis you or a loved one might be going through um I, I think that God was has been able to use what I went through for his glory. And don't just sit silently and disengage from church. Would invite listeners to to dig in deep. Hey, ask those tough questions. God can handle it. Mm -hmm. God can handle it. And asking the tough questions is not inappropriate. It's not um it's not heretical to do so. And it's better to fight through your faith than to give up on it. And so uh, I'm just really grateful, Kevin, that you give me the chance to share this because I am passionate about um, 
digging in and asking those tough questions, staying plugged in to a community of faith, not treating doubt like it's the enemy, you know, yeah. everything that we've talked about today. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Jaron, appreciate you, brother. Take care. Mm-hmm. Likewise. God bless. Bye-bye. Wait for my caffeine to kick in. Yeah, I'm, I'm sipping on my BB-8 coffee right here. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Caffeinate with BB-8. <laughs> <laughs> that might go in the bloopers.